My name is Ben Knowles from East Coast Yacht Sales and in this video I'm going to be talking about the Simrad screens on an Axapar and the basic functions and how I like to use the screens. So please take a look at this video and I hope you enjoy. So starting off with the basics of the Simrad screens which are the primary main menu that you have on board here. Um, and this is your, these are all your apps that come pre-downloaded on the Simrad screen. Um, the apps that that I'm commonly most using are the chart app, the radar app, and the engine app. Uh, those are the three most common apps that I use on the Simrad screen. For apps that you do not use, there is a way you can eliminate these, these apps if you're not using them, but for the purpose of this video, it's more gonna be what are the practical uses for these screens. They're very powerful, they're are way more systems and functions that uh, you can do. I probably scratch about 10 to 15 percent of the capabilities of these Simrad screens, but um, I'm just going to walk through how I use these screens and my thought process personally. Um, when it comes to screens and navigation, it really is a personalization conversation, but I think it's helpful sometimes to hear someone else's opinion on how they like to use the screens and then you can develop your own processes and thought process on uh, on how you want to use them. But um, uh, after a fair amount of time using these Simrad screens, I've really come to like the use of these screens and so we're going to dive right into it. So this is your primary main menu and you've got your from the main menu, you've got your settings function here. You've got your uh, chart options here, and then these are your split screen options. I personally don't find myself use, utilizing sp split screens all too often, um, but uh, for some folks, that's very helpful. But from your chart perspective, I, when running in normal conditions, I like to have both charts up. Um, and these screens are at their factory settings right now. So I will just talk about the, what sort of data I like to see on these screens and, and how I like to set them up. From a basic functionality, um, you see how there's this orange border around this area of the screen here. If I were to touch like the audio here, see how this orange box goes from uh, over here. Same thing, orange boxes right here. And then if I were to touch these data boxes, there's an orange um, box there. So that has a fairly meaningful effect. Um, for instance, uh, this you can zoom in and out with the screens, but if you have the orange box selected over here, all you're doing when you, when you turn this toggle is just toggling through those three menus. So you need to make sure that you have the screen selected and then you can zoom in and out nice and easily. Specific to settings that I like on the on the charts display, first thing is when I'm setting up these screens for the first time, see how the boat is in the middle of the screen right here? On an Axapar, you're kind of driving a Ferrari. Um, I'm not, you know, if you're driving a Ferrari, you're not looking at the rear view mirror, or at least I've never driven a Ferrari. That's what I would think anyway. You're more worried about what's ahead of you. So having a boat in the middle of the screen, um, you're kind of losing some visibility and what's going on forward. So I like to have, I like to set the look ahead right here, which look ahead basically means that the boat jumps down the screen here. Um, so I, I really like having the look ahead because that means I can see what's ahead of me more. I also like having the head up orientation just like I have right here. This is set up sometimes from the factory it's north up. Um, I personally like the head up orientation. Um, you can also from here have your chart option select, uh, selected. In these screens uh, when we deliver a new Axopar um, we put a Navionics chip in, this, in, in the ducts here. So um, we're selected on the Navionics chart right now, which is uh, the, the charts that I personally like to use. Um, but if you wanted to use CMAP or another version of charts, you can put them in the window port here, and then this is where you would select your chart source, where, where you're getting the information on your screen for, specific to the charts. Other chart options, 
that I like to think about is uh, the safety depth. So what the safety depth is, it's preset from Simrad to have a safety depth at 60 feet. So this is where this light blue is, and then the darker the blue is, the shallower the water is. Um, I, you know, having a safety depth at 60 feet is a little too conservative for me. When running at 30 knots, you know, if you've got an option for 60, 30, 18, and six as a safety depth, um, I personally like 18. When you turn it to 18, that's gonna make it so if it's 18 feet or shallower, that's when I'm gonna start seeing the variety of shading um, on the screen, which, uh, which I like. So I like to always set the safety depth to 18 feet. Dynamic icons is also an interesting one, which is this right here. Uh, what a dynamic icon is, is this box right here. Uh, this box is telling me uh, that the tide height is 5.6 feet above the average uh, low tide and the tide is rising right now. I don't typically have these dynamic icons uh, selected because I also have on the, on the menu here, or at least on the other side, this screen right here, I have the information on what my tide height is. Um, so I personally don't find these dynamic icons helpful. The dyna dynamic icons also do tell you what your, uh, where your current is coming from, which some people may find that helpful. Um, I'm okay with not having that extra information on the screen, but you may like that. Um, so I turn the dynamic icons off. I always like having the chart details on all. So all the other more standardized options on here I think are pretty good. So this is set up the way I kind of like it. Now there is one other location where you can make some important adjustments on this screen specific for the charts and that is going into your settings um, and then your chart right here and this has some helpful inf stuff that you can change. Uh, you can change the sizes of your boat. I just have it on center console. Uh, one thing I really like to utilize is these extension lines. And the extension lines are lines that are coming off of the boat. So if I'm looking at this screen over here, um, which this boat right now is actually on uh, course up, I'm gonna change this to heading up but you have um, no extension lines coming off of this boat and you, the extension lines that you could choose are course over ground or heading. Um, and those are nuanced, but very, it's telling you very different information. What a uh, heading line is, is just telling you the direction that your boat is physically pointing in. So the extension line for heading would just be going straight forward. Um, the extension line for course over ground tells you where you're actually going. So let's say you're underway making way, you're doing 20 knots and you're, in, you're getting set by wind and current. The, the course over ground line is gonna tell you where your boat is actually going, assuming that the external factors and your boat speed, everything else remains constant. So I personally really like the course over ground line. Um, that tells me where I'm actually going. I don't find this heading line overly helpful because it's only telling me where I'm pointing. And if I wanna know where I'm pointing, I can just look outside the windshield and, and see for myself. So. I find that the course over ground line is telling you something that I wouldn't otherwise be able to necessarily know. Um, I also find that people can get themselves into a little trouble by having just a heading line out there because it doesn't really give you any perspective that you're being, being offset. You know, uh, So on this screen here, if you're pointing in this direction and we're getting offset over to shore and our course over ground line is going off like this, that's like, whoa, I'm, I'm headed in a very different direction than I would anticipate that I'm going in and that can give you a little bit of an early heads up on hey you need to change your heading so you can change your course over ground to the direction that you actually want to be going in and then within the course over ground line you can change the length 
This is a preset length for one mile. I personally like the infinite uh, course over ground lines on the boats. So I do like that, uh, including that in the extension line. Uh, down here also you can uh, have your waypoints, your routes, and your tracks constantly visible. I don't really care for having any of this information up there. Um, if you do select a route, then the route that's active will be there, but all your other routes that you've set won't show up on the screen. Uh, it can just get a little busy um, if you set a lot of routes and you have a lot of tracks. So I typically don't have any of those show up on the on the screen. But uh, again, so a lot of, some people do like using their tracks and that's how you can turn the tracks on and off just from right here. So those are the basic functions. Now see how I've set my course over ground line and off of the boat, this line is going straight back, which can be very confusing. The course over ground line only works while you're underway making way, meaning you're, you're going somewhere because what it's doing is leaving a bread crumb, crumb trail and it's measuring your, your heading based off of where you've gone. Um, so if we're at a dock right now, so if you're not moving, then your course over ground line is gonna be super wacky. But um, when you're underway, it can be very helpful. So looking more at the bigger picture here uh, when setting up these screens for the first time is you can really set all your information on your, on your data box here. This again is very much so personal preference. This is kind of preset from Simrad here on what information shows up. Uh, to change this information, you can just press and hold here. You can change the information that you have. Uh, the way I like to have these dual screens set up is on the port side have more um, boat, engine, and fuel information. And then on the starboard side have more general information, speed and water temperature and stuff like that. But you, for each one of these screens, you have seven pieces of data on each side. And you end up, so you end up with 14 pieces of data I find that 14 pieces is more information than what I really need, but so the last few few data points is just kind of like a, uh, well, I guess we'll do water temperature because I don't know what else to put in here. But um, in general, what I like is I like having the depth. I've selected this data box right here. I like having the depth right here. Same thing on this other s screen. I like having the depth on the top. Uh, reason for that is because I want to, whenever I'm in a foreign spot and I start to get worried about, okay, well, where's, how much water do I have? My eye typically goes to the top right hand side of the screen. So I want both to have depth just so I can find that information as quickly as possible. Uh, on the starboard side of the screen, the next thing I typically like to have <clears throat> is my course over ground. And you can just see all the variety of different information that you can be tapping from. I think course over grounds, yeah, it's under vessel. And so on this third piece of data, I like to have heading. Again, see how the course over ground is way off from the heading? That's just because we're not moving anywhere. I like having this 12 volt supply here. Uh, this is telling me what my uh, house battery voltage is. One important note with this piece of data is that I find that by the time the voltage goes from the batteries through the wires through this screen, this tends to this data point is reading about 2.2 volts less than what the batteries are actually reading. So I always typically add 0.2 volts to this number. And then here I like to have the tide. So I really like this tide information. Again, because we have about 10 foot tides, this is quite helpful. Here, I think it's kind of fun to have water temperature. And then here, I typically just have boat speed, which actually I think is here. Speed over ground. So speed over ground. So this is typically what I like to have on the port side. I'm sorry, on the starboard side of the screen. And then on my port screen here, I typically like to have my engine data. In the form of RPMs. 
So port RPM here, starboard RPM here. I find that engine trim in general is how hel is helpful to have here. Fuel economy GPS, which is telling me how many miles per gallon we're getting. Down here, you're kind of getting towards the end of useful information. So I tend to go for the basics like time and date. Local time and date right here. And last but not least, of course, is your fuel level. So this is what I typically like to have on my port screen. This is the information I typically like to have on my starboard screen. Now, when I am navigating and following a route, which we'll get to the routes later, um, I actually sometimes like to bring up an additional uh, data box on the port screen here. Um, and you can do that by, you're, you're selecting this starboard data box, you press the menu button here, and then it's bar one. Bar, we just, did bar one cruise, so on bar two we can put that on general and what that will do is add a whole nother different subset of information and here what I can do is, is have information specific to the nav, so bearing to waypoint which is what I need to steer to be headed to the waypoint that's active. Sometimes I like to have distance to waypoint. I like to have uh, distance to destination. Estimated time of arrival at destination. All the variety of extra stuff that you don't really need unless you are following a specific route. Uh, time to waypoint is kind of fun to have and and once you get to this, again, you have seven pieces of data. Once you get to the bottom, it becomes diminishing returns. What information I think is helpful, of course, to steer. So this is helpful for when you're following a route. Now you can shut off the second data bar when you aren't following a route. So it's, I'm only bringing this extra information up under general when I'm following a route. So that's kind of helpful as well. We've adjusted some of the basic parameters on the starboard screen. I haven't really done it on the port screen here. Um, so again, I like to have under chart, extension lines, coast over ground with the infinite. I eliminate those data as waypoint routes and tracks. Um, when touching on the screens, uh, under more options, I like to do the look ahead, chart options, safety depth at 18. So these, you have to do this on either screen, uh, which is good because sometimes you'll want one setting on one screen and not on another. So um, I find this actually nice, but you do have to do it twice. We'll leave the dynamic icons on the port screen just for fun and full chart detail. So this is all pretty well uh, set up the way I like it. There's another common question that we, we get, which is uh, auto routing. How do you set up an auto route uh, for your boats? How do you think about auto routing? And I'll talk about the auto routing right now. So when auto routing, I, you want to set a route for once you get out of a harbor and once you get more into open water. So we're in the Royal River right now and I don't really need an auto route to get out of the river. Um, it also can be a little bit more challenging for the auto route just to figure out the zigs and zags of the Royal River. So let's say we want to go to Booth Bay, for instance. So I'll point the cursor right here and I'll just go to the menu and we'll do new and we'll do a new route. And so I'll just, with the cursor on the cross there, I'll just press this button, center button here. Okay, so I've set one point on the map here, and then I will go to Booth Bay. So Booth Bay Harbor, and again, I'm not gonna have the route end in the, in, in the harbor here. I'll just have it 
the, the next waypoint go right here. And then I'll go dock to dock auto routing for the entire route. Oh, it wants me to set the boat settings because this is the first time we've done this on this boat. So save. Now we can do the entire route. And now the auto route is going to calculate our waypoints. Uh, Dr. Duck auto routing has just said it's successful. You press OK. And now the system has set up a route for us. And whenever you do an auto route, it's always a trust but verify sort of scenario. So you just kind of zoom out, check out to make sure that it's not taking you anywhere funky. You, you can make adjustments if you need to. This looks totally fine. So I'll press keep. I'll press save, and I'm just gonna call this route, let's pretend that Yarmouth is our, my home port, so home port to Booth Bay, enter. So now I've just saved this route. Now, uh, let's say we're out of the, the Royal River, we're underway, making way on the boat, and I want to follow that route that we just created. Um, that's pretty easy to find. You go to main menu, you go to the waypoints, go to routes, and then you have your home port to Booth Bay route, which is 32 nautical miles. You press that, you say start, and you go on, it asks you if you want to go forward or reverse, so we'll just say we're going forward, and now we're officially following this route. So that's how that works. And again, when I am following a route, what I like to do is bring up my second data bar here under general which is telling me the bearing to the next waypoint my distance to the next waypoint and my estimated time of arrival which is going to be forever because we're not mo moving but this is a extra set of data which is helpful to have when you are following a route now to cancel out of this route and not follow it anymore just go to navigation and cancel so all pretty straightforward and easy. Um, another question that we commonly get is uh, just how to do a radar overlay. Um, so if we're switching over to low visibility night mode, if you will, depending on, on the circumstance, um, I'll go have a radar set up on this screen. And then on this screen, I'll have my radar overlay, which is selected right here, it's already selected. Sometimes this can be off. So if you don't have your radar overlay on, then this won't overlay. So my radar overlay is on. Um, there's a couple different ways to get the radar started. I just like pressing the power button and doing transmit right here. And then the radar will start transmitting and you'll start to see the overlay on the screen right here. Pretty straightforward there. So this is more of my night mode on my port screen. I have just radar and radar only. This is radar overlay. The reason why I like to have radar on one screen and overlay on the other is, you know, when you're out there in the fog and whatnot, you, uh, because there's so much extra layers of information on this screen, you can kind of miss some minor targets. So that's why I like to have the radar only on this because it's a black screen against red dots. So you can see more of the nuances of what the radar is trying to tell you. Another thing, uh, as we switch and start talking more about the radar and navigating via the radar, probably the single most important thing to learn how to use a radar is to start using it when you do not need a radar. Meaning when you're out and it's a beautiful sunny day like it is today, uh, use your radar, get used to what it's telling you, pretend that you can't see anything and just look at the targets. It will be tremendously helpful for you because there is in some interpretation of what the radar is telling you and what actuality is, you know, um, sometimes buoys will be made out of metal, sometimes they'll be made out of plastic, and all that has a very different reflection on your radar, and they come up in very different ways. So um, definitely use the radar when you don't need it. So when you do need it, you have it. So what I do like to set up for settings, um, most of the time I am have a gain under auto, sea clutter under auto, and then 
most of the time if I'm using a radar, I'm in harbor mode. That's probably because I'm usually going a little bit slower, so I, I do use harbor mode. Um, but I bounce between harbor mode and offshore mode depending on my boat speed and what the conditions are. But uh, one thing I do like to do under target tracking is some zone tracking. And the zone tracking, you have zone one and zone two. Zone one is your immediate, your immediate circle. So this is basically inside a half an aqua mile, it'll automatically target um, track targets. And then also zone two, it's anything inside a nautical mile and going up into inside half an aqua mile, it will track targets for you. I typically am just using zone two, you know, cause you're tracking all those targets from one nautical mile in. And what a target tracker is, is you see this icon right here. And again, this is not the right scenario to be doing this, but um, this, is a, this is a target. And then that little line right there is the, way, the direction at which the radar thinks that that target is going in. So it can be very helpful for you. Um, so I like to use target tracking. You can have it be a full 360, or you could just do a sector, the forward sector. Um, the circle, I think, is probably a good call. The reason why I don't do zone one is because that is inside half an aqua mile, and anything, in, I don't even try to have any targets inside a half an aqua mile for me if, if I am in a no visibility or low visibility scenario. So I do like having this auto um, this auto uh, targeting feature that you have here. So that is the only setting that I typically do use with the radar that may be a little different than the norm. So that is what I wanted to cover just regarding the radar. Um, this engine information is all fairly straightforward. There's not too much to talk about here because it's just the information that's giving you is, is quite straightforward. Uh, the reason why there's communication here is just because I don't have any of the engine stuff on right now. That's all pretty straightforward. Um, one other question that we do sometimes get from customers is um, they'll have a boat, they'll have the MMSI number plugged into the boat, um, but they keep on getting an alarm. And what the alarm that they're getting is a CPA alarm. And I'm gonna show you how to shut off the CPA alarm. And what a CPA alarm is, is the Axapar 37 has AIS, other boats have AIS, and CPA is closest point of approach. So if you get inside a cer certain distance of another boat with AIS, it will set off an alarm. Um, I find that being fairly obnoxious when you're coming into a harbor because every time you come into a harbor the VHF is just going to go wacko. So to shut off your CPA alarm, you go to alarms, you go to CPA alarm, and then you just make sure that it's off and you can turn it on here or off here. So that is something that um, I, don't, I don't find the AIS alarm overly helpful. I find it a little bit more obnoxious. I mean, if you are offshore for days and days and days and maybe not paying attention like you should, uh, maybe it makes sense to have an AIS alarm. But um, when you're on an Axpar day boating and cruising, um, a CPA alarm, I don't think is of much help. So that's pretty much all the things that I use on, on these screens. I really have come to uh, be used to these menus and if you guys have any questions for me on items that I didn't, didn't cover, please do feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions.